Greetings, and welcome to the Open-Minded Skeptic Podcast. My name is Sharon Ann Rowland, and I'm your host. In today's podcast, we'll be discussing the protests surrounding the inauguration of the 45th President of the United States of America, Donald Trump, On January the 20th, 2017, the 45th president, Donald Trump, whoever thought we'd be saying that, and the 48th (laughs) vice president, Mike Spence, took the oath of office. The oath of office of the president of the United States is the oath of affirmation that the president of the United States takes after assuming the presidency, but before carrying out any duties of the office. A large number of protests were planned in connection with the inauguration of Donald Trump. Security preparation for Trump's inauguration gathered nearly 28,000, that's a lot, security personnel to participate in Washington, D.C. The vast majority of protesters, several thousand in all, were peaceful. However, many violent acts such as property destruction did occur. Now, there seem to be two main areas where the violent kind of uh, protesting um, occurred. There was in Washington, D.C. at the inauguration or around, and also in California. Now, anyone that follows U.S. politics will know that California is like this hotbed of leftist, fascist, socialist Democrats. And um, not that I want to insult everybody in California, Bobby, but they do seem to be um, the most verbal and that's also where Hollywood is. And um, unfortunately, they have they they have a rather large microphone um, having Hollywood there. So th- a lot of the protests and a lot of the the kind of I suppose you say the anti-Trump kind of propaganda does come out of that area. Now in Washington D.C., um, there were there was the deplorable held the night prior to the inauguration. And so that was January the 19th. And uh, the deplorables basically um, gathered outside the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., where where the, the ball was held. And several protesters threw debris at attendees, hitting one man in the head. Police responded with tear gas and pepper spray, scattered the crowd. Also, on the day of the inauguration, another group called Disrupt, Disrupt J20, they linked arms at security checkpoints and attempted to shut them down. Some elements of the protesters were black bloc groups and self-described anarchists and engaged in sporadic acts of vandalism, rioting and violence. So basically they tried to block anyone coming to the parade. You know, um, There was also other protesters, about 100 of them, and they were all in black. So a lot of people think they may actually be the group that's now known as Antifa. And a group of around 100 of those smashed windows of businesses in downtown Washington, tipped over garbage cans. They blocked entryways to the event and chained themselves to barricades, Um, basically trying to stop people from being along the parade route. And they they basically gathered at designated spots, waved signs and chanted anti-Trump slogans during it. Um, They had the occasional clash with the police and demonstrators and um, were masked generally throwing rocks and chunks of concrete at the police. Um, Police in-fight gear responded. Again, you had tear gas, pepper spray, flash grenades, and crowds dispersing. Um, The the protest continued into the afternoon, and um, a limousine was tagged with graffiti, its windows shattered. It was later set on fire. And at this time, it wasn't known, but the limo was actually owned by a Muslim immigrant. So um, they were actually targeting a minority and they didn't realise that. Uh, the fire spread to, this is, I think this is quite funny, Bobby, the fire spread to a Fox News crew SUV, which was parked right behind the, the limo. In that particular altercation, 230 people were arrested. And of those, 217 were charged at the federal level with felony rioting which if convicted is punishable by up to 10 years in prison or a fine of 250 grand. That's American dollars. Six officers suffered minor injuries. Um, On July 6th this year, so they they were in jail, I don't know, I suppose for a year, um, a year and a bit, 
Um, it was reported that 21 of the defendants pled guilty, including one to felony offences in connection to the riots. So I take it a lot of people got off in that case. 209 mm. people got off. I don't know. That's interesting. So that was um, Washington, D.C. Now, also, in, as I said, in California, another kind of hub of anti-Trump, I imagine he doesn't go there for holiday, on the morning of the inauguration, anti-Trump protesters blocked the headquarters of Uber in San Francisco because the CEO of the company was seen as a collaborator with Trump. Around 16 people were arrested in the demonstration, which created human chains to block the officers. Other companies blocked Friday morning in San Francisco where the Wells Fargo headquarters and Caltrain tracks. In Los Angeles, thousands turned out for a peaceful protest on Friday despite the rain. Demonstrators rallied outside the Los Angeles City Hall. Now, because it was California, um, some artists also got involved called LaBeouf, Ronco and Turner. And they started a live streaming, a planned four-year protest titled he will not divide dot us at 9 a.m. on the morning of the inauguration. Um, participants were invited to deliver the words, he will not divide us into a camera mounted to a wall as many times and for as long as they wish. In what artists described as a show of resistance or insistence, opposition or optimism, guided by the spirit of each individual participant and the community. The footage was broadcast on a 24 seven feed which the artists announced would run for four years or the duration of Trump's presidency. The initial host of the artwork, the Museum of Moving Images in New York, abandoned their involvement with the project after three weeks, sadly, citing public safety concerns. The installation became especially contentious after a white supremacist started yelling 1488 to the camera and because of increased loitering in the area around the museum with the museum receiving threats of violence. The artist, meanwhile, said that the museum had bowed to political pressure in ceasing their involvement with the project, adding that there had been no incidents of violence that they were aware of. Um, I, don't, I think the artists are um, not correct there. I've actually seen footage of where it was damaged. The exhibit relocated on February the 18th to a wall outside of El Rey Theatre in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Sheila, do you think the protesters should have protested at all on Inauguration Day? Or should they have, like, seen that as, it's Inauguration Day, let's just suck it up and let him have his day? Uh, I would suck it up, sweetheart. You know, you vote for someone, it, it's like kids in the school playground who didn't get their own way or didn't get the ball. When do they grow up? Seriously. I was, I'm, I've been quite shocked. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, it's take, I'm going to, you know, you don't want to play play the way I want to play, so I'm going to take my bat and ball and go home, eh? That's what it yeah. feels like. Yeah. And kindergarten is actually a really good example for what's going on. It's a it's a very puerile response to, you know, the, it's and it's not like they didn't have a good go at it, is it? I mean, Bobby, he's been in power for, Obama was in power for eight years, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Two terms. So, you know, it's like they, they had a really good run at it. And um, it's, it seems a little churlish, I think, to their, their current behaviour. And especially on Inauguration Day, I would have thought that they, they would have just let the new president go in. Cassie, what do you think? Do you think the protesters should have protested at all on Inauguration Day? I believe it's actually I'm going to differ I believe it's a good time to really state an opinion because it's the issue is so live but I don't agree with how they went about it like there's nothing hurting just saying I don't like what's happened but the fact that it got so violent and so pushy I do not agree with that it's okay to have an opinion but it's not okay to be forceful with your opinions so I think you know most people who are protest protest when the issue is on fire, like when it's hyped and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not surprised that they chose that day. But I think if they just came with signs and just said they didn't agree, and maybe they should have just left it there and just looked at what happened and just taken in if there 
just it should be an educational thing. That's what protests. We'd like to see what happened with protests, not going mm. worse than pushy being pushy. Prote good protesters don't push. They just educate. That's in my opinion. So I can understand why they chose that day to say what they needed to say. Yes, no, I, I know where you're going, and I I agree. I don't think, you know, I think there's a question coming up too about the violence versus being more of a Gandhi approach. I suppose, Amanda, what do you think? Do you think the protesters should have protested on inauguration day? Yeah, I, I do, and and I have to sort of say with Cassie, I do agree that it's a good day to do it because at the end of the day, if you're gonna, you know, like, you know, again, it's it's that freedom of speech, it's that freedom of expressing your opinion. So on that day when he's going to be sworn in, yeah, okay, that's a good day to do it because it is, it is, uh, you know, it's no use doing it after he's done it. It's no, and I understand that he was already voted in. Um, but, you know, on his inauguration day, yeah, I don't agree with the violence myself either. But then in saying that too, I, I tend to agree with Sheila as well in the fact that the, the you know, you've already opened the gate, the horse has already run. So therefore, you, you're sort of really achieving nothing with that uh, protest. You're, you're just, you're, you're really just, uh, you know, causing a lot of chaos and mayhem when there was really no need to, you know, he had already been uh, voted in by the public and, you know, this was the formality of what he was going through. So, yeah, pretty much suck it up and, and, and you know, and, 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 and enjoy the day for the fact that you're undergoing a new uh, chapter in, in America's history. Exactly. And uh, Bobby, do you think the protesters should have protested President Trump on Inauguration Day? I, I believe that, you know, Americans have the right to protest uh, peacefully and uh, it doesn't really matter what day they choose, whether it's inappropriate or not. That's a right we want to protect. And uh, I believe that, uh, you know, they, they are whittling it away sometimes where they make you get a permit and they say you can't protest here, you got to protest over there. Um, so there's some of that going on, which I don't like. Because we want that, we want to preserve that right to protest peacefully. But a lot of these, or most of these you mentioned, they, they turn out not peacefully. And I mm -hmm. believe that a lot of this is caused by paid ag agitators that are brought in. And these are the guys with the ski masks over their face that are breaking the windows and all that stuff. Sheila, the American people had spoken through the ballot box. They voted Donald Trump into power after eight years of Democrat rule. Why do you think the Democrats refused to accept the result? I, I really feel, having watched it very closely, Sharon, that they were probably still in shock because I'm sure they didn't think that Hillary could lose. I didn't. I was, I was completely <laughs> stunned. Yeah. And as everyone's been saying, you know, Donald Trump is not and hasn't been a politician. He's a businessman. So he was the, the ring in, wasn't he? The, you know, the, the horse you weren't expecting to get the race. The dark horse, as they say. The dark yeah. horse, yeah, exactly. So I, I think a lot of it is probably the shock factor of that can, this can't be true, that can't be happening. And if I don't accept it, if I do not personally allow that it's happened for me, then it didn't happen. And it's it's that bury your head in the sand or in a paper bag or something, I think, for a lot of it. Um, and, and we see that horse race again if we think blinkered. Some people are so blinkered to what they believe is right, that they can't see anything outside of that belief. I Just agree. I, I actually think, well, I, after dealing with a few people, I do a bit of um, online commentary and I can't post anything without being trolled. And it's, it's, um, and it's not even, uh, like uh, what I'm posting is factual and I still get trolled. And, to me, that means that these people, in a way, are, are delusional. 
I mean, they, they're just not willing to face reality. Yeah. OK, Cassie, why do you think the Democrats refuse to accept the result? I agree with Sheila too, because I remember watching the election and was a big surprise that Trump actually um, came forth. Um, but I can understand it in a way because Hillary did a few things that weren't um, quite um, kosher. So I can understand why people just sort of turned off Hillary and maybe gone to Trump. But I guess it's just a big change because the Democrats have been in for a long time and it's just to think mm. that someone who is like Donald Trump and not as educated as politicians in more of maybe political way has just come in and overturned things. And I think it's just that big change and shift in consciousness about who rules America now. I think it's hard for them to fathom that someone like Trump could actually win over someone like Hillary, if that makes sense. No, look, that is that is actually, I think that's, that's actually a key point. What you're talking about there is class. And I think um, a lot of the people that vote Democrat feel like they're more elite in society or they're a bit more cultured, they're a bit more educated. And mm -hmm. what actually happened was the, you know, they, they, everyone who lived in these places like California and that, that feel that they're, you know, better than the average farmer or, or southern person, you know, basically were stunned that the rest of the country actually had the audacity to vote in someone like Trump. But um, yes. I'm sure Bobby will agree. Um, I think they're afraid of him. They're very afraid of him because he's not, he's not one of the, you know, good old boys in the Congress. He's an outsider. He's got a lot of money. He can't be bribed easily. He knows what the hell is going on. He's got probably a lot of dirt on all of them. And they're all <laughs> dirty, except for just a couple. And uh, everybody knows, well, not everybody, but a lot of people know that the voting machines are a freaking joke. Um, you know, they're not secure. There's no paper trail. They're ridiculous. If you want to, you know, if you want to do it right, you could do it on the Internet with, uh, you know, secure, give people secure tokens or something. It's like it's a joke. It's easily hacked. And uh, so everybody expected Hillary to win, you know, for all those reasons. It's easy to hack. And they were shocked when she didn't win. And mm. uh, and Trump won. And Trump scares the hell out of them because he knows what's going on. He can he can. He can ruin all of them if he wants to. And a lot of them are resigning or saying that they're not going to run next time. You know, they're going to pursue other interests. They're stepping down. So I, I think there's, you know, Trump is backed by, I believe, the white hat cabal. And there's a war going on between the white hats and the black hats in the deep state. And I believe that, you know, Trump is their man. They went and asked him to run and uh, they you know, explained everything to him and he agreed to do it. He doesn't have to do this. He doesn't need it. He's got tons of money. He could be doing something a lot more fun than what the hell he's doing. So Sounds like he did a lot of fun things too. It's all yeah. coming out. So <laughs> so that's what I believe. <laughs> it's you know, I the only thing I'd like to add, because I think you've all um had excellent points there, is um I think the fact that he was probably the first person that ran that couldn't be bought because he had his own money. He doesn't. He didn't need to, you know, go cap in hand to, you know, the George Soroses of the world and people of that, you know, with the money to actually get him made. So he's not had to sell out. And I think there isn't a there isn't a politician anywhere that I I can identify except for Trump that has had the money to actually just take the presidency without having to make promises left right and center and i think that's a lot of the reason why he's been able to actually do things that are that are correct and actually fulfill his promises i think a lot of these guys make promises they get into power and then they get then the people that have got them into power basically sidle up to them and say okay now you're in power it's payback time Sheila, is violent protest okay ever? 
Is it ever okay? That's a tough one, Sharon. Part of me says, no, it's not. And yet there's a, a very small part, I suppose, that says if it's an, an, an end, you know, there's absolutely no other option, then maybe I would consider it. Um, I, I've lived through protests as a child, you know, armed guards, um, six o'clock curfews, stuff like that overseas. So it, it's something that I was familiar with growing up and then came to Australia and didn't have any of that. So it, but it's also the same as is protest in any um, ever okay? So, you know, do we protest within the home? Do we protest within society? Um, you've got to weigh each one up, I think, on its merits. So that you, you do think there are situations where you can protest violently and it's, it's a correct thing to do? Correct's not the right term. If you push someone hard enough that their back's against the wall um, and they're fighting for their life, then they may well come out and, and protest violently. But when it's, you know, your, your um, candidate didn't get the, the prime job, then no, it's not. But, but if it was the French Revolution, it's okay. <laughs> well, it was the French Revolution. I'd be on the side of the revolutionaries. That's why I'm exactly. with Revolution Radio. Exactly. So basically, if like Murray, uh, what's her name? Murray. Murray <laughs> it's basically just told you all to eat cake because you can't, because you've got nothing to eat. <laughs> it's that in that situation. Yes, we can chop a head off. But if if it's just you want you lost the election, then go, you know, suck yeah. it up type thing. Is yeah. that what we're saying? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so everyone, note: keep away from Sheila on your notes. <laughs> and on to Cassie. Cassie, is violent protest okay ever? I was thinking no until I was listening to Sheila. I, I believe once. <laughs> I like. I'm not saying that it's right, but I think like once their fighting happens, the actual idea gets lost. Um, but people are people, and sometimes when we feel threatened, and that's we feel that that's the only thing that we can move forward on. But in this situation, I don't think it's really necessary. It's about who's in power. It's not like um, someone coming to kill your family, or you know, you're not in that violent situation. That's a cycle. You're in a peaceful place. It's a peaceful situation. It's just this is more your opinion. You didn't get your way. So, therefore, you shouldn't have to fight for it. I think that's just a very immature to do if all you're protesting about is you didn't get your way. But if it's about your lifestyle and your health or if your country's being threatened, I absolutely agree with Sheila. Sometimes you need to push a little bit harder. But in this situation, no, there shouldn't have been any violence at all. Yes. Um, okay, Amanda, Jean, what do you think? Should Is violent protest ever okay? I think the moment you go a violent protest, you're losing the message anyway. You know, you're going to be, uh, at the end of the day with a protest, you're trying to give across a positive message. You're trying to give across, uh, as Cassie said earlier, a, an education, you know. So if you're if you're rioting or, or, or becoming violent in a protest, then you kind of, unless you're protesting that, you know, the basic well, no, I don't. I just, I just can't see a protest where violence is going to solve it. Bobby, is violent protest ever okay? I don't believe it's okay ever, because you know, in my opinion, the idea of protest is just to get a number of people out there to show, you know, how many people are backing this particular opinion that that this group has, and that that's all I'm seeing it as, you know, a show of numbers. So, uh, but the interesting thing I was thinking about was when the American patriots threw the bales of tea into Boston Harbor, was that a violent protest because there was property damage? <laughs> probably, yeah. There's some, um, yeah, probably I'd, I'd agree that that would be seen as um, violent. But what I, what I don't like about 
these protests is how they cover their faces. It's the same as when you're on social media and someone doesn't have their face visible mm. or their profile semi-open. And um, I, I think that is awful. I think if, if you're willing to say crappy things to people on social media, I should be able to go check you out and see, you know, what you what you look like or um, find out where you're from. So like if you're talking about Russia or something, then I'm, I'm, I should be able to go and make sure you're actually from Russia and not, you know, <laughs> and not from, a, you know, a member of the FBI or somebody like that instead. <laughs> um, sorry, that's a bit of a joke at the moment. Um, okay, so I, I, I agree with, I think Amanda and Bobby then, I don't think there is ever a reason to get violent. I, but then I grew up in England and I remember being quite touched when I learned about Gandhi and how he protested in India. And basically they all just sat down and um, prayed and meditated. And the British didn't know what to do when they saw, you know, because he wasn't being violent. So back to Sheila. Sheila, do you think that the Californian Democrats, liberals, leftists, socialists, there's quite a few in there now, um, are the most verbal and loudest of President Trump's critics? Or is there another group you might name? Well, in my limited research on this subject, Sharon, I think you're probably pretty right with these ones. But that's just my opinion. Cassie, do you have another group or do you think uh, it really is that, that, that part of the country that's causing all the, the ruckus? I'm not. I think I'm a little bit too separated from this question to really understand it properly. For me, being in Australia, all I can really see is noise. A lot of people are making a lot of noise. I haven't really investigated who the people are. Um, it's just because all I can hear is noise because... There's so many different opinions being tossed up in the air that I'm getting all of it and I don't know what's truth and what's fact. Um, just being in Australia, we can see what's on the media um, back home. It, it's, it is interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I'm, I'm quite into the US. I spend more time on the US sites than um, the Australians because Australian politics is boring. Do you, do you not agree with me? <laughs> no. Oh, yes, oh. yes. We need we need um we need a Trump we need a we need an Aussie Trump because although do you know who I I thought about it the other day you know who would make a really good one the guy from the bush not the one that just had the baby illegitimately you know that one the other one um what's his name Warwick Kappa is that it no he's a footy oh fan. um <laughs> you'll know who I mean I just can't I can't think of his name at the moment um he's he's always defending the bush. Oh, he's, he's, yeah, he's in the he's um he's in the North Queensland sector. Um, oh, cripes! What's his name? Yeah, it'll come to us crazy, anyway. Yeah, he's he crazy old guy. I can see him doing a being our Aussie Trump. So, um, and I much prefer someone like him to um, like a Pauline, wouldn't wouldn't you, you ladies? So. Yes, Bob Catter. Bob Catter. That's it, Bob Catter. That's He's been it. brilliant. He's Bob Catter for president. That's it. Oh, prime minister. <laughs> we don't have president, Bobby. We have a PM. So, um, okay. So, hey, Bobby, who do, do you think that the Californian Democrats, liberals, social dem democratic socialists are the most verbal and loudest of the president's critics? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Because um, California has always been, you know, pretty liberal, at least Southern California. Um, like when you start going up north where the farmers are and stuff like that, that's why I think, you know, California is talking about splitting into three states because, uh, you know, most of the people are in Southern California and they're very liberal um, or communist. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I I think they're starting a lot of trouble, and uh, but I do believe that you know this is all fueled by um, by the media in California. You got uh, movies and TV, but you know in New York you've got a, the news, and you know I believe that 
all this is fueled by the news. It, it just keeps pumping the people up, you know, making them, you know, making them do this stuff. And, you know, if if, if things were treated fairly, if, if Trump was treated fairly, you know, things would settle down, I believe. Sheila, with the rise of social media and instant news and celebrity, do you think this is the norm from here on? Is this is this how every election will go, or do you think Trump is an anomaly? I'm hoping Trump's an anomaly. <laughs> I'm just scared a few of you, didn't I, with that question? <laughs> Sorry? Did I scare a few of you? Because you hadn't thought about that, had you? <laughs> that this might be the beginning of the end, basically, for, like, <laughs> genteel genteel politicians and elections mm. well i'm not particularly into politicians or elections and especially australian ones but uh, uh, <laughs> i um i think look social media is media is wonderful and you and i use it a lot um sharon and you know we use revolution radio as well um but i think there's also as you were saying some drawbacks so, Cassie, with the yes. rise of social media, instant news, celebrity, do you think this is the norm from here on? Is this how every election um, in the US run? I think D Donald Trump's definitely left the door open um, for the generations of presidents to come. But just um, observing our generation, everything's very hypermedia at the moment. And sometimes the truth... Um, overwhelmed by stuff that's on the internet so sometimes we don't know what's going on really but I just think that um, the younger generation um, let's see um, love celebrities so much that everyone that sort of makes it on the news is kind of like an instant celebrity these days and mm. I don't know if that's a good thing or a, a bad thing it's just a thing um, but I think Trump being the colourful person he is, I think he's opened the door for a lot of new changes in in history. I mean, not history, the future with politicians and that. I think there's going to be a big shift there. You yeah, know, I have to agree. And um, I, I also think a lot of the reason he's done as well as he has is when he was doing the reality TV, um, America got to know him as that persona and um, as that powerful kind of businessman. So I think I think him being on TV, and I think he was on TV for a good ten years, wasn't he? Doing that reality show, Bobby. I, I don't know what it was, how long. It felt like he was always on TV. I don't know. It was a while, but I, I don't watch too much TV anymore. No, who does? <laughs> it's all YouTube these days. Um, so Amanda, do you the rise of social media and instant news, do you think this is the norm from here? Has has Trump basically kicked the door in and from now on every politician will be treated this way? I think so. I think this is and, and this is the, the shift. You we've gone from uh, the unknowing uh, you know, the unknowing culture. Uh, where it's just pretty much what we read in a newspaper or, you know, see on a, on a flyer or whatever, to suddenly this access with, um, you know, the internet and all that sort of thing. So now, now we can, we can access stuff all over the place. And, and I think the, you know, what Trump has done and being the astute businessman that he is, Trump has turned around and said, well, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to actually get to the masses. And he's realised that social media is the masses. Now, Obama and stuff had already started. Look, um, you know, prior to Obama, there wasn't, you know, uh, George George didn't really have the the whole grasp of of social media and 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 da da da. da. Obama comes along. He's quite uh, social media orientated. Um, you know, and he and he and he sort of falls into that that social media quite smoothly and starts using it. The only thing is they never really used it for the um, their campaign and, and things like that. So then along comes Trump, and I think he sort of went, you know what, actually, we need to tap into this. We need to tap into this gold of, of picking up 
you know, the social media. So, you know, the, the ridiculous tweets, the, the, the crazy, um, uh, you know, Facebook and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, it meant that he was in, he was in a variety of homes, uh, from the younger generation right through to, you know, uh, the, um, older generations that were becoming a little bit tech savvy and, 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 you know, and still oriented, but then he still used the old school, uh, you know, um, things of paper and, and all that sort of stuff to get his message out as well. Yeah. Do you know what I think he did? In a, in a, if yep. I would just sum it up quickly, I would say he turned politics into entertainment. Absolutely. Because, because he, I he threw out the rules. He threw out the rules. Watching him. I mean, yeah. who, has, who hasn't, who doesn't wait for a tweet? I mean, yes. I, I don't, I've never really used Twitter. I've got an account for the magazine, but I've never tweeted that much until he came along. And now I, I, I only follow, I think, about 10, and he's one of them. And I hang yeah. out for the tweets because, seriously, they are, not only are they entertaining, I mean, scary sometimes, but entertaining. <laughs> and, you know, and I love the way he, he speaks. Like, if somebody pisses him off, he actually says it, you know, and, or, or he gives it back to them. And I'm thinking, it's, there's absolutely no polish. It's, it's pure turd, you know. It's he no has, he has no... <laughs> There's no, there's no filter whatsoever with that man. And I think that's what a lot of people find really quite refreshing is that, as Bobby said, you know, you looked at the Obama speeches, they were very, very polished and very, very clean, you know, almost Teflon-like. Yep, it is a game. It, it is to him, and, he's, play, and he's, he's the only one that knows the rules at the moment, but they're going to learn quick. So, Bobby, with the rise of social media and instant news celebrity, do you think this is the norm from here on? Uh, well, I think, you know, politicians have been using the Internet for quite a while and they don't have to really understand it. They can hire just a techie to handle it. They all have websites and stuff. Uh, but Trump is the first one that's, you know, gone into tweeting, which tweeting <laughs> hasn't been around all that long. Well, it's been around for a while, but not super long. It's, yep. it's a relatively new thing. Um, and he's really, you know, exploiting it. So yeah, I think I think this is going to you know make make people use the internet more you know in the future. Yeah, no, I think I I think he pretty much kicked the door in, um, got and turned over. He's 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 in, remade politicians and they're now sexy and entertaining. I think so. That's just my personal view. You you guys may not join me on the whole sexy bit, but that's fine. <laughs> Okay. Well, he's made it more palatable, that's for sure. He's, he's definitely making it more, uh, you know, enjoyable to watch because it is it is literally just, you know, turning, taking something that supposedly was quite boring and, and you know, sort of mundane and blah, 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 and, and made it sparkly and shiny. And, and he doesn't care if it's positive or negative. He's just like, this is, this is great. Let's have a, let's have fun. Let's just make this. Let's make this work, and and he's working it in, you know, in a in a in a, a weirdly you know sexy way. He is no, doing it. He is. <laughs> yeah, no, look, I I, I, agree, I agree with you. It's I just yeah I I find it all. I think it's I just think it's great. It's it's evolved. Politics is evolving, and you can see it. It's it's having an effect. I mean, even Putin to an extent. Um, Although I draw the line at him taking his shirt off and riding horses on along the beach, I don't want to see that. Sorry, <laughs> so I don't, I'm not I'm not bored with the whole you know Putin thing. And and I think by the way him making himself you know um, leader for life, you know, is probably really <laughs> not a good idea. And uh, that, that seems to be very popular. Well. That's all for our podcast. Thanks for listening. And remember, if you want to support what we do, then share, subscribe, and leave a positive review over on iTunes for the open-minded skeptic. My team and I look forward to entertaining you once again in our next podcast. To check when our next podcast is, simply head over to www.tomspod.com. That's www.tomspod.com.